Well, thanks guys, appreciate those awesome announcements. We are so glad that you're taking time to hang out with us here at Anchor Church online. You know, I'm laughing because uh, this whole paradigm is just drastically different than anything that I'm used to. Uh, I get real conscientious about my nose. Uh, sometimes I get a little pricklies up there and it's itching and it causes my eyes to water. And so it, it's really great for the camera because, man, if I just turn that into like a very serious moment, it conveys like, oh, man, pastor is really hurting over this and it's leading him to tears. But more than likely, I just got something itching in my nose this morning. Uh, so forgive me if I do this. It feels so weird to do that on camera. Uh, but it, it's, it's interesting how when God shifts our comfort to dependence upon him, the things that we think of and the struggles that we now face and how he's, he's so willing to move us outside of our comfort zone. And oftentimes, pain can be associated. Suffering can be associated. Uh, there can be struggle, obstacles, difficulties, frustrations. And I'm willing to bet that many of you have felt that way during this season that you felt frustrated and you felt a little off. And if you're feeling any of those feelings, I just want you to know that that's a good place to be. It's a really good place to be because in those moments, you have an opportunity to lean on God, to trust in Him, to seek greater dependence upon God for what He wants to do in your life. Because God will shake things up in order to lead you to a place of spiritual growth. God will let you go through difficulties in order to grow you spiritually, to grow your dependence upon Him. And so during this season, we want you to know that God can work and He is at work. And I want to share a few stories a little later on about how God has moved and I believe how he wants to move here in our world through Anchor Church. I know that in this time, it's hard to make plans, but we genuinely believe that there are specific things that God has called us to, tasks that he has appointed to us that he wants to accomplish in and through us, and we believe that he will bring it all together. What a joy it is to know that God is in control. I want to give you guys an update uh, financially of where we are as a church. Some people have asked about that. Uh, here's a good thing we have not had to pay rent to APS, uh, so we get to save a little money there. When we first started, we made sure and put a freeze on spending, that all purchases had to be approved and necessary during this season. We knew that there were going to be people and situations that would require extra resources that weren't budgeted for this season. We, we didn't expect to be in a pandemic, but thankfully, God has provided, He has sent his resources. Uh, our church is operating. I just ran with our bookkeeper, the P&L, for the month of April. And so we're, we're positive $3,000 for the budget year. That's a big praise. Uh, I've talked to so many churches that are down, but we are not one of those churches. So I want to thank you to all of you who support the mission, the vision, and the values of Anchor Church, that you give your tithes to the Lord through Anchor Church. It's making a difference. Uh, God is so faithful. Uh, not only have you impacted us here financially with your contributions, but we've been able to help in Kenya and I want to thank the gift that was given this week for Kenya to help them with some flood relief. We've been able to give them food. We've helped East Central Ministries just a couple blocks away 
from the Anchor South location and gave a ton of food away. We gave a ton of resources away. Uh, wet wipes galore. Uh, this is a good thing. Uh, we've been able to help families in need. There's several families that we've provided food for and that we've also provided lodging for. Uh, we've also been able to sustain and uh, support our staff at Anchor Church. Uh, I'm so grateful that God is supplying uh, his resources. I know that Justin and his family moved here to take the call to uh, be church planters for Anchor South. And they've done such a great job of raising support outside of Anchor from other churches that we partner with, like Hoffmantown and Albuquerque's First Baptist. They've been great support to Anchor South and Justin and Julie's work that God's called them to. And, and we're thankful that uh, areas like that aren't, aren't dropping off and that the staff is fully funded. And so we want to say thank you. We know that some of you out there uh, that are watching have been hit hard by this financially. And, and you're wondering what your next step is. And we want you to know that we are praying for you. Uh, that's why we made those yard signs. So you could put in your front yard and say, hey, do you have a need in your community or a prayer need? Anybody walking by? How can Anchor Church be praying for you or see if we can help you financially in any way. God's so good. We can't do everything, but we can do what he has assigned us to do. And so we'd love to be able to help in any way we can. Why do I say all that? I want to tell you about my friends, Dylan and Cheyenne. Dylan and Cheyenne just gave their life to Christ. It was about five years ago that I met Dylan. He's friends with Tyler and Samantha and we met at a, uh, a friend's funeral that I was performing. And he reached out to me and said, said I, I, I need some direction. I need some help. And over these five years, God's taken him on quite the journey. And in that time, he has really been broken before a mighty God. And he's ready to start new and start fresh spiritually, emotionally, financially, physically, he is ready to move forward. And it was this week that God answered a massive prayer. I had prayed that God would awaken their hearts, that he would rescue them in their time of need. You see, our church has been coming alongside of them. We've helped them in a situation where they're down on their luck. They are ready to start new, but they need the resources to do so and the support system to do so. And this week I prayed diligently and I begged God to move in their lives, to bring salvation to that home for both Dylan and Cheyenne and for their future child. They're pregnant. Psalms 127.3 says a child is a gift from God. It's a heritage from the Lord. And they are so excited because this Friday they prayed to be certain of their faith to know for sure that their eternity was secure, that they could have a home in heaven and hope for today. If you're watching out there, I'd love for you to follow the same example of Dylan and Cheyenne, that you might confess your sin to God, that you might commit your life to him, that you might surrender your future and your plans to God because he wants to take control, yes, of your life. And he wants to lead you on a new and more purposeful direction. God can do that, and I encourage you to do so today. You see, prayer works. God listens to our prayers. Prayer is important. Today, we're going to be talking about our strategy on how we seek to accomplish the mission of the Great Commission to fulfill the vision that God has given us here at Anchor. The vision is to anchor people to Christ by planting churches that love God, love others, and make disciples who, who do the same. The mission that we've been given to accomplish that vision is the great commission to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything that he's commanded us. And lo, he is with us always to the end of the age. Well, how do we strategize 
the mission. Because there's a lot of ways you can go about doing that. And I like any approach that the Lord gives us peace about. Well, where do we get that peace? I believe it comes through prayer. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about many of the components that we would call the strategy of Anchor Church to do the Great Commission and accomplish the vision he has given us. And today I want us to talk about prayer. There are some dynamic prayers in the Bible. If you get a chance this week, maybe go one through each day during the week and, and look at some of these prayers. Look at how Moses will intercede for Israel in Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 through 14. Take a look at David's prayer in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 18 through 29, in his heart for God. Look at Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Take a look at Mary in her song of praise, her prayer of praise in Luke 1, 46 through 55. Spend some time in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us how to pray. Look at, in fact, the prayer of Jesus that's found in John chapter 17. Look at these several prayers that you could do this week. Read them as a part of your quiet time. Supplement that into your walk with God because these are dynamic prayers and they can help shape us on how we ought to pray, the things that we should be praying about. I love this from the Westminster's Catechism. It says, prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Hold up on that catechism for a minute. Take a look at it. Prayer is an offering of our desires. Psalms 37, 4 says that when our desires become his desires, he answers our prayers in powerful ways. Our desires are important to God. He gave them to us. He gave us passions and thoughts. He gave us these desires that we might fulfill His mission. And many of the desires vary. So when we pray we can offer a variety from our body of the desires that God has given us unto him. But let's make sure that those things are filtered through acknowledgement of sin. Because we've got to agree to his will and not ours. That's the key. The focusing in on our desires unto God must always have an element of repentance from sin and seeking his will. Think about your life when you pray. Do you put time and energy into confessing your sin before God, acknowledging it to him, and asking for change? When you pray your desires to God, do you align it with the will of God and beg it to be in conjunction with God's plans? You know, Jesus is our mediator to God and when we pray, he filters our prayers to the Father. Now, anything that is full of pride or envy, any kind of sin, those get filtered out. Thanks be to the Holy Spirit in us that shares that message and, the, and Jesus will filter that message for us. But could you imagine if you're walking in such a way with God in alignment with the heart of God and the will of God and the plans of God that you are now 
in agreement with God. Imagine the power of those prayers to be answered and always be grateful and thankful for God's mercies that are new every day. Because when you start praying like this, you're going to be reminded of where you fall short. Uh, Paul's going to address this in the book of Ephesians, and we'll see that in just a few short minutes. But the closer we get to God, the greater to us his holiness becomes. We see it with greater perspective. It hasn't changed, believe me. But we get to see greater the glory of God. And as we grow closer to the Lord, through our prayers, it reveals in, uh, in our own lives how much further away we are. And apart from Jesus, and apart from his righteousness, and apart from his holiness that he imparts to us, we realize, wow, what a wretched man I am. We could agree with Paul. And we might think we're the worst of all sinners. When you pray and you thank God for his mercies, it should show you the greatness of God and show you how far you are from that apart from Jesus. Uh, many men and women of history are noted for their thoughts on prayer. I want us to look at M Martin Luther's statement says to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. I woke up today and it was natural for me to breathe. It still blows my mind that I breathe while I sleep. Yet God sustains my life. To live, you must breathe. And as a believer, to live spiritually, you will be marked by regular prayer. Max Licato takes a slightly different take, and he says this. He says, our prayers, they may be awkward. You might feel a little bit more like Licato here than you do Luther. Our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. In the book of Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 19, we're going to see a prayer that Paul prays that I believe can make a huge difference. Anchor Church, you're not going to see it right away. It will grow and it will build and you'll remember this passage. But if we can apply the same intensity that Paul had for the church at Ephesus, the Ephesian saints, we're going to see God do amazing things in our city, in our state, in our nation, in our world, through our church. And these prayers are very specific for the individual because I believe revival starts always in the heart of one that leads to others. Revival must start in our own hearts today. Join with me as we read. Verse 14, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom Every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. What a prayer. 
verse 14 is coming back to verse 1 of chapter 3. In chapter 3, he starts off in verse 1, says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. And then verses 2 through 13 speak to the Gentiles. He circles back and he comes with this powerful prayer for the saints at Ephesus. The Christians that were living there. Look what he says in verse 15. He's going to talk about every family. Every family in heaven and on earth. And before you think that this is a universalist approach, that everybody gets to go to heaven, because it is not, take a look at John chapter 8 with me this week for more clarity on that. Spend some time in Romans 8. Look at Romans chapter 10. The doctrine of salvation, it's available for all mankind, as John 3.16 states. But there will be few that respond in faith, that are saved by grace. And those that respond in faith, that are saved by grace, from all ages of the church, of past, present, and future, is who Paul is talking about. And what does he do? Verse 14 says he bows down. He takes a knee. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. This kneeling is to, to bow and pay homage. It's a picture of his heart. The, the throne of his decision making. The seat of his emotions. Uh, how he feels about this church family and the honor that he places upon God as he talks about them. It led him to kneel, to bow down. Uh, you could see Daniel going into his prayer closet. You could see people in scripture lifting holy hands. You see people laying prostrate. Some will kneel. You'll see Jesus in the garden there's all kinds of different ways physically to express our desires of the heart through prayer unto God. Some people like to drive and pray. Keep them eyes open, okay? When we pray, it doesn't matter about our posture so much as it does about our prayers, but sometimes our posture can evoke emotion that enhances our prayers unto God. You think that might be crazy? Well, think about any time you're at a sporting event and a great play occurs. It leads you to stand up onto your feet and to cheer. You might throw a fist pump. If you're a lobo, you give a woof, woof, woof. You open the mouth, though, you don't close the mouth when you woof. Otherwise, it's a muffled hoof. We do all kinds of things in society. We now get our cell phones at concerts, and we turn on the flashlight, and we sing along with the band. We sway to music, and we walk away from those moments and say, how great was that? How fun was that? We need to do that with prayer. We need to add some physical action to many of our prayers because the strategy we seek to fulfill the mission and accomplish the vision that God has given us, it is to pray big and audacious prayers. I mean, big prayers. What kind of big prayers are you praying right now? Would you like to know some that are on my list? I mean, I, I'm praying. I'm praying for God to eradicate coronavirus. That's a big prayer. I'm praying for God 
to move in such a way that we have global unity on our response to this and that he could give us a plan to charge forward into the future. I'm praying for this building right here. I'm praying that God would draw people to a launch team to start this church here at Anchor South. And I'm praying that they would reach this community at the International District, at the Air Force Base, at Uptown, Midtown, and all the way to UNM. I'm praying for people in our church like Anna, who just shared with us that she has lymphoma. I'm praying for my father-in-law, Bruce, with prostate cancer for a miraculous change in these people's lives. I'm praying for people who are struggling with anxiety, with depression, and are lonely in this season. I'm praying the prayer that my dad taught me. God, would you just give us some land? I remember my dad said that in his living room. I looked, I said, that's a pretty big prayer, dad. Could you just give us like 10 acres? Give. And I go, I need to be praying that prayer. So would you join me and ask God to answer some of those really big prayers? And Paul has some really big statements in here. Look what he says. He says that he longs for them to be strengthened. According to the glorious riches of God, to be able to do this, he prays that they would be strengthened with power. To be strengthened is an indicator of weakness that needs to be made strong, that needs to grow. He's asking for God to take these people who are spiritually weak in some areas of their life and grow them according to his power. This is dunamis, his intrinsic power, his dynamic and dynamite-like explosive power. So Paul's praying for this church that he sees their spiritual weaknesses. And he knows that there's glorious riches that God has to be able to strengthen these people and grow them with some explosive kind of growth spiritually. You might see someone who just is dragging their feet spiritually. Discipleship issues all over the place. They're having a hard time reading their Bible. They're having a hard time praying. They're having a hard time resisting temptation and walking in the spirit. Uh, maybe you see in their life, they don't give to the kingdom of God and they hold on to all of their finances for themselves instead of joining God and expanding his kingdom. You see people that are struggling to, to pray out loud or alone. You see people that are struggling to lead their homes spiritually that they're deferring spiritual leadership to their children, to Netflix or Hulu, or to the school systems, and they're making no effort to lead in their homes. I know as a pastor, uh, um, it's always best to help lead people to their own aha moment you know, to lead them to a place where they can see in Scripture that they need to grow in this area. And for me, I fight with that because I want to just say, here's how you do it. I'm not perfect, but I can tell you I know the perfect one, and he's got a plan for your life, and this is what it should look like. In those moments, God always just grabs me. He reminds me, first of all, of my deficiencies and where I still need to grow. But then he says, do you not trust that I can do this in their lives? Do you not trust that I can lead them to this change and to that aha moment? And in those times, I pray, and I wish it was as powerful as Paul was praying here. 
But maybe in the future, I'll begin to pray this way for explosive growth in people's lives. I, I just be honest with you. I, I have a, a couple and they came to me and they shared with me they needed some help financially. They asked for it. They wanted biblical counsel. I said, okay, here's what you got to do. You're swimming in debt and you're a slave to the lender. Let's work on a debt reduction plan. And I see here that the first fruits of your finances, it goes to yourself. And God calls us to give to the kingdom of God. I see here that you need to show some restraint in this area of your life. And for a season, it will be really tough. But I believe that if you follow God's plan, you can do this. And God will give you that victory. And I've done this long enough to know that the advice that I give people it is about as good as, as, as much as they paid for it. <laughs> Which is nothing. They don't pay me for it, but it, they ask me for it. And so I've learned to tamper my expectations because my hope is, yeah, they'll follow this biblical plan in their life. But I know by experience that oftentimes many don't. And I remember thinking about this couple and wanting this so bad for this particular couple. And you wouldn't believe it. They shared with me in recent days that they have decided to tithe, to give. Not to just give a token to the Lord, but to trust the Lord financially and to give from the first fruits and give a significant part of their finances to the kingdom of God. In this same month that they decide to do this, I also hear the victories that they have of the debts that have been paid. Wow, that's growth. Huge, significant growth. I hope those people feel the joy and the spiritual pride, not in a bad sense, but in a positive sense of following the Lord and the results that God is giving them. I think about people that have struggled with an addiction in their thought life. As we're talking to a broader audience here today from kids to adults online, I'll let you fill in the blanks. But they've been dominated up here by unrighteousness by evil. And I've said to these people, what's it going to take to change? And I know that I too have to take every thought captive and I'm not one who is exempt from being tempted in the thought life. But I said, let's get to a pattern in your life where you can have victory over this regularly. Oh, the joy has come when I fervently began to pray for those people and join them in their desperate pleas to God for victory. And it's so cool to see those people walk in that kind of victory, the strength that they feel. We, as a church, our strategy needs to be focused on big audacious type prayers to God. So big that when we see the pattern of people's lives that has not changed, we can be audacious enough to ask God to do a big thing in their life and bring healing in their life and growth spiritually. That's powerful. Think about the homes right now where kids are facing more today than they ever have in their entire life human history of children. Think about the difficulties that those kids are facing. We should be praying for families and those children. We should be praying for homes that are on the fringe of divorce and ruin, that God could bring restoration to those homes and to those people. Let's pray for some big prayers of spiritual growth and see what God could do in our midst. He then goes on to say in verse 17, 
that those who grow spiritually could, they're going to be strengthened in their inner man, in their inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. The word dwell here is to take up a full residence, complete residence by his spirit. And that can happen through the faith of the people that will say God could do the miraculous, that Jesus could bring a miraculous healing. It's that kind of belief and that kind of faith that invites God to take up residence in a person's life. It's that kind of faith that invites God to say, there's nothing off limits in my life, God. You make yourself at home here. The inner man is what I believe 1 Peter 1, 3, Romans 7 will address, that we have salvation and it comes. And the Holy Spirit lives in our house called the temple, our bodies. That God is here. But to have the inner man strengthened is to allow the Holy Spirit that's in the house to take up residence, to be at home. Hey, we got a dog this week. His name is Beasley. He's two years old, a little wiener dog. You might think he's Beasley from The Office, Pam Beasley, or Cole Beasley, the former Dallas Cowboy, small and powerful and quick. That's our little Beasley. And the first day that my wife came home with Beasley, because uh, she came home and surprised the kids and me with a dog. People said, do you know what kind of dog it is you're getting? No. What, what is it, a male or a female? I don't know. How old is it? I'm not sure. But my wife's bringing home a dog. And that little dog has snuggled up close to its mama. And she brings little Beasley into our house. And Beasley's walking around very timid in our home. He's not quite sure what's going on at this house yet. And then I show up. I said, this is a new person. My kids walk in. This is a new person. What's going on here? And Beasley, he's in the home but he's not at home yet. Well, it only took him about five days to make himself at home. He has sniffed every square inch of my house. He is a great, fun, spunky little dog, and we love him already. He knows what parts of the house he's welcome in and what parts of the house he is not welcome in. This is my house. He's not allowed on my bed. The children might let him on their beds, but no, 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 no. That doggy does not get in my bed. Now, some of us were a little bit like me with God. We've invited God into our home to take up residence here in our lives. And we are the temple of the living God now. And we tell God, you're welcome here, but you're not welcome here. And you know the difference when a friend comes over versus someone new. A friend might have refrigerator rights. They don't have to ask. They just can open up and grab food out of the fridge. My kids have had friends like that in our neighborhood. They just come on in and they help themselves. That's beautiful. Others feel the need to ask. See, some of us, we need to move from God coming into our home and us telling him, you need to ask permission to get into the fridge, you're not welcome on the bed, to God, make yourself at home. This is your house. We are so glad you're here. John MacArthur references Robert Munger's uh, Make My Heart Christ Home book. And I, I like what he says. 
It's the picture of the Christian life as a house through which Jesus goes from room to room. And he, he talks about in the library, which is the mind, Jesus, he finds trash and all sorts of worthless things, which he proceeds to throw out and replace with his word. In the dining room and of appetite, he finds many sinful desires listed on a worldly menu. In the place of such things as prestige and materialism and lust, he puts humility, meekness, and love, and all the other virtues for which Believers are to hunger and thirst. And he goes through the living room of fellowship where he finds many worldly companions and activities through the workshops where only toys are being made into the closets where hidden sins are kept and so on through the entire house. Only when he had cleaned every room, every closet and corner of sin and foolishness could he settle down and be at home. That is the hope of this prayer, to strengthen the inner man, the Christian who is saved, but needs to allow God to have room in their lives to do as he pleases, to make himself at home by dwelling in their hearts. We talk about inviting Jesus into our hearts. This is saying, God, i I'm allowing you, I'm giving you permission, I'm inviting you to do this because God doesn't force himself upon us in this respect. I believe with all my heart that there needs to be a yielding on our part and a surrendering on our part to a righteous and holy God. We say to him, you have your way, God. Strengthen me in the inner man and dwell in my heart through faith. And Paul says, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is length and width and height and depth of God's love is, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What a prayer that people might feel the love of God. To know deeply God in an intimate and loving way. To experience that agape love. He's praying a huge prayer for these people that they could comprehend with all the saints at this church and for the church age in human history, what the very length and the height and the breadth of God's love is, the deepness of his love, I'd say that's a pretty good strategy to get across the mission of the Great Commission that will end up anchoring people to Christ and planting more churches that make disciples who love God and love others. The strategy to accomplish the vision is so important. We do not want to accomplish the vision by any means necessary at all costs that we could end up erring in hostility or sin or pressure or manipulation. The strategy can feed the mission. If we're praying for our people to know God's love and experience it and the riches of it and the depth of it so that they can share that love, those who hear the Great Commission are going to see the love behind it. I gotta say, these people are coming to me with authenticity, with genuine hearts, filled with the love of God, not motivated any other way but than by love. I mean, prayer is important, guys. Yes, it's important. It's the armor that God gives us to fight the strategies of Satan, it's how we arm ourselves 
to fight the strategies of Satan. It's how we combat anxiety that we'd see in Philippians chapter 4. It's how we fight the good fight. We start with prayer because prayer will align our hearts with God's heart and we'll see what his plan is. And we'll begin to pray for big and audacious things to accomplish within his will. In James chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, it says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you won't fall under judgment. Is any one of you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders' church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he'll be forgiven. So therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. And it is effective. Do we want to have Mark 11 type prayers? Prayers that move mountains? Do we want to pray like Charles Spurgeon would? Where he'd said, if you believe in prayer at all, expect God to hear you. If you do not expect, you will not have. God will not hear you. Unless you believe, he will hear you. But if you believe, he will He will be as good as your faith. We need to pray. We need to pray. Our strategy is prayer. So I ask you today, what kind of prayers are you praying? Are you praying big prayers or small prayers? He wants them both and everything in between. But don't lose sight of the opportunity that is in front of you to pray for big and audacious prayers. Do you have prayers that have the kind of potential to move the heart of God? Are you wrestling with God like Jacob did? Are you praying on behalf of Israel as Moses did? Do you have an Abraham kind of a heart for your community where you're going to go back and back and back to God persistently begging for a Sodom and Gomorrah? Are you praying prayers that have an opportunity to stretch your faith? Say, woo, the only way this could happen is if God did it. Yes, take the time, as Thomas Kincaid would say, to pray for the people right then and there when they present their request. And when we ask for prayer, let's be willing to pray right then and there. But let's also be willing to recognize if our prayers are small, the people will forget to pray. They will. So when we request prayer... If we ask a small one, let's pray right then and there. Say, would you pray for me right now? And we can request that they continue to pray. But realize, humans are frail and we'll forget. But when you ask for prayer, why don't you ask for some really big things to happen? Because I know I'm praying for the really, really big things in people's lives regularly until I see it happen. And church, there's some of you I've been praying for for years for the requests that you've brought to me. And you're begging God as well. And be persistent. Be like that persistent widow. Just keep coming. And we're praying for you as well. There's some big things that God can do. And if he hasn't done it yet, in this season of your life, he's drawing you closer to him to depend on him. And there's something he's showing you that's different that that you're not seeing in this time. But let's ask for big prayers. How do I do this? Here's a suggestion this week. Try praying one minute for every hour. Every hour, pray one minute at a time. Say, okay, right on the hour, set an alarm. Have it go off. And seek the Lord for 60 straight seconds. 
This could sound legalistic, and if it becomes that for you, just dump the idea, okay? It's not that brilliant anyway. But this will help you to begin to pray without ceasing, to have a conversation with God all day long, to where you don't just feel like I pray at dinner and I pray as I fall asleep, but yeah, now I'm connecting with God all throughout the day. 60 seconds, concentrated prayer, talking to God. Try one hour a week. One hour for a whole week, break away. This will be a stretch for me. I'm an ADD puppy dog. I've got kids running around and working from home. It's going to be difficult. So how would you do that? Maybe write out your prayer. Do a prayer journal. Get away so you can be focused on it. Or go for a prayer walk. And just you. And go and walk and thank God for all he's done in your life. And appreciate the beauty. But come back to praying for really big things to happen. Not just in your life, but in our church. Imagine with me what our church could look like coming out of COVID. If we are strengthened in the inner man and we have some explosive growth spiritually happening. Imagine what our church could look like if matched with our spiritual growth, we have this overwhelming love of God that we're comprehending and growing in and discovering and experiencing more and more of every single day. He's revealing it to us and we're growing in it. Imagine with that kind of spiritual growth and experiential love that we could have as an impact on the world around us. I believe the strategy will accomplish the mission so that we can fulfill the task that God has given us to anchor people to Christ by planting churches that love God, love others, and make disciples who do the same. Jesus, you're so good. What a blessing it is to meet with you this morning, to be with you today. Lord, we think about the, the power of this sermon and the power of this prayer that it has for us individually and for our church community. It has power to affect generations upon generations. Lord, as we strategize, may it always be centered in prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to invite you to worship with us today. Chad and Jair are going to lead us. And if your kids got to get up and run around, ask them to do some hand motions to the songs, to jump up and down, to, to let them do circles around the couch for a little while. And you just keep singing to Jesus. You worship him now. We're so glad you're here with us today. sing this blessing over you and with you um, as we just are reminded of such a deep and, and, and important part of our lives, um, prayer. Allow this time to also be a time of celebration and prayer as, as we close out our time together. Ah! Uh -huh.
favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 Kids, this is the time you want to dance.
The world that he gave us his one and only son to save for God so loved Thank you so much for joining us this morning. May you have a great day filled with great opportunities to do great, amazing things. God bless. Have a great day.